So, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Fergal Cattle, and I am uh, Secretary of the Structures and Construction uh, Division. So, just want to welcome you all here uh, this evening. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Just the uh, fire exit. The, the main fire exit is the door that you just came in, and then the, there's an alternative one down here to your right. And just uh, if you could turn your mobile phones to silent for the next hour or so, that'd be uh, much appreciated. So, uh, our lecture this evening uh, uh, centres around uh, post tensioning and building structures and uh, I suppose uh, uh, in, in, in innovative solutions and the use of PT to bring uh, cost effective and sustainable uh, building developments. And we've got two speakers tonight. Um, I think the running order is uh, Fergal Cleary and uh, then followed by uh, Tim. Uh, Fergal Cleary is MD of uh, ClearTech Engineered Solutions uh, who offer value engineering and specialist experience in post tension in the construction market in Ireland and abroad. Uh, Fergal has 20 years hands-on experience in the technical design and construction of large uh, multidisciplinary projects in civil, railway, highway, large span bridges and, and has worked extensively in Ireland, the UK, Australia, the Middle East and Asia. Fergal is a chartered engineer with a, a master's and a BS, uh, BSc in structural engineering. And then we have uh, Tim Peters. Uh, sorry, I forgot your there at the start. Uh, Tim has uh, extensive experience in uh, numerous large-scale building projects uh, uh, in Australia, Asia, the Middle East, uh, the UK and more recently in India. He has particular expertise in the use of post-tension solutions for building structures and is recognised for delivery of uh, project-conscious uh, uh, buildable solutions. Tim sits on the Academic Advisory Committee for the School of Engineering at Griffith University and has lectured on post-tensioning at Griffith University. Tim has been involved in numerous projects projects throughout Queensland and internationally in recent years. So I'm just going to hand over uh, to Fergal initially and at the, the end we'll just take uh, some questions and answers as well. Okay, thanks Fergal. Thank you Fergal. Um, okay, uh, basically post-tensioning. What is post-tensioning? Um, post-tensioning was developed back in the 1950s by Eugene Fresenet. And basically, he developed our present-day post-tensioning. Uh, it was then later brought on to America by T.Y. Lin. And what we have now is a very cost-effective and, uh, I suppose, sustainable technology that uh, is being used all around the world. Um, here in Ireland, it's just something that's coming to the market. And we want to go through today uh, where we've used it here in Ireland and where it's been used internationally as well. So I suppose when we look at projects, what we're trying to do is we're trying to value engineer and use post-tensioning in that format, where we can, I suppose, do a sustainable solution and reduce down the materials, reduce down the quantities of concrete and rebar that are being used in buildings. This example that we have here is a typical example of a reinforced concrete solution and the exact same solution in post-tensioning. And there's a massive difference between the quantities, the size of buildings, and uh, the savings that can be got from a post-tension building. So I suppose throughout the lecture we'll be referring to the costs, um, where savings can be made on your projects. Um, if you look at it here, uh, the savings are not just in the basic floor slab depths and the rebar. It comes from the likes of, if you're doing basements, you have reduced depths of construction. Um, in the top, where we have a reduced height, uh, which means that our facade has reduced, our services now don't have as long to, to come down through the building. So it isn't just the savings in the concrete and the materials that we're looking at here. And that's one of the things that maybe a lot of engineers forget about, is that there's massive savings elsewhere in the building. Uh, because we are reducing the, I suppose, the dead load of the building also, the foundations are also an area that uh, there are significant savings. Um, throughout the, the slideshow, we'll, we'll demonstrate to you the percentages uh, of savings, both in rebar and concrete, uh, that can be got from using a post-tension solution. So, the benefits of post-tensioning. And what we've done here is we've looked at 
what are the benefits to you as, say, a designer, right? What we can do is we can reduce the slab depths, decrease the dead weight of the building. And again, what we're trying to get to is, I suppose, the savings down through the building, down, through, down to the foundations, by reducing down that dead load. And what we're talking about is reducing that dead load in the thickness of concrete inside in the slabs by almost 25%. So that's a massive savings in the dead load of the actual building. Uh, for the designers, um, there's less rebar to detail because the difference in rebar between an RC solution and a PT solution is approximately 66%. So there's a savings of 66% in rebar. Um, we have additional deflection reduction and crack control. Because we're putting that compressive force inside in the concrete, we're able to, uh, I suppose, manage our deflection and control our cracking. What we give is flexibility in the layout and the structural form, right? We can increase durability because we're giving continuous compression across the, the section of the slabs, and we get better uh, chemical resistance. So that's from a designer's point of view. But there's more people involved in any project, and it's, it's basically the stakeholders that we've got to consider in all of these things. So the benefits of post-tensioning to the client owner. Again, what we're looking at is reduced building height, leading to material savings of the cladding, services, <clears throat> the additional floors. In, in some instances, what we've managed to do with, say, uh, multi-story uh, buildings, by reducing down the thickness of slab, we've been able to put in an additional floor into the actual building itself, which gives the client a lot more lettable area. So from that point of view, the client has an extra floor that he's getting extra money from. And these are the sort of things that when we're doing our analysis <coughs> on these type of projects, these are areas which give an advantage uh, to the client and to uh, the developers. So there's freedom of floor layouts, right? We get longer spans, and we'll demonstrate later uh, the comparison between an RC solution and a PT solution. We get column-free areas, right? Uh, we have shorter lead-in time, and we have thermal storage. For the contractor, and this is important as well, there's rapid construction, okay? In Ireland, that hasn't really been the focus. Um, we find with the likes of the form, uh, the form people that they're not ready for post-tensioning just yet. They don't seem to be able to get that, that, that idea of the rapid construction. Um, I can understand why that is in the fact that we're reducing down their concrete, the amount of concrete, the amount of rebar. So there isn't an, uh, an inclination there for, for post-tensioning at this stage, and that needs to change. Okay. We can get large pore areas. And because we're using post-tensioning, we can get lot, a lot larger pore areas. And because we're thinning down the slabs, we're able to pour this, a similar amount of concrete over, a, over that area. So we get a lot larger pore areas. Um, we have less res requirements for ex expansion joints, fewer construction joints, because we're getting, getting a, lot, a lot bigger areas. And we get early striking of forms. We strike the forms in approximately four days. Uh, now, it depends on the strength of the actual concrete. Okay? One of the important points for contractors is, particularly when you start looking at materials, storage of materials on site, you're reducing down your rebar by 66%. So there's less area required for rebar. Um, you've got less concrete delivery to site, almost 25% less. In, in the floors. And if you allow that to go down through the foundations and everything, you get continued savings inside in the, the concrete delivery. Um, and we have re less reinforcement to fix. Uh, these are all important points when you're looking at the likes of LED and, and things like that, which are becoming a lot more important in the buildings that we're building today. And sustainability uh, is really one of the, most, one of the key areas that post-tensioning can be, can be used in. 
Um, I'll hand you over now to Tim, and he'll go through some of his experiences uh, with post-tensioning and uh, what he's doing abroad uh, in Australia and uh, the Middle East. Thanks, Fergal. So Fergal and I decided to tag team tonight. Um, so hopefully um, you won't need too much uh, hard listening on my accent and there's no uh, need for any interpretations. Um, however, if I do use some terminologies that aren't familiar, please uh, shout out. Um, we'll take a few steps, a little, couple of steps backwards um, because what I do find, and that is in terms of relation, just in relation to the general explanation of post-tensioning, because I do find that there is quite a lot of general confusion out there, just, just in basic terminology. And, and because we are specifically talking about post-tensioning, i.e. we are tensioning the cables post um, setting of the concrete, we are still dealing with a pre-stress system of which there are precast solutions, etc., etc. So the important thing is that post-tensioning is a pre-stress solution, as is pre-tensioning. So there is a di a, the, the main difference being that pre-tensioning does get involved in more precast systems, whereas post-tensioning has the benefit of being placed in situ, and we're able to get the benefit of continuity by placing the cables in a profile. And that profile generally will mimic the def deflected shape of the structure, which is when, when you're conceptualizing or visualizing structures as a designer, it's important to consider um, what the deflected shape will be because we, are, we live in an in a environment that requires design from an ultimate condition, but also from a serviceability condition. And we need to satisfy both of those. And, and certainly when we start pushing the limits of slab thicknesses, deflection and deflection control becomes a very important thing. So post-tensioning is a pre-stress system, but tensioned post-setting of the concrete. And that the anchor system that's used is, is designed around a concrete strength of 25 newtons, so that the full force is applied when the concrete achieves 25 newtons, which generally on today's concrete mixes is somewhere in the three to five day range. Um, and of course what that does allow is self-support of the, the concrete system, blah, blah, blah. A lot of other advantages we'll talk about. I have also mentioned the word partial pre-stress there. Um, it's another, it's another we hear or we use. Um, I consider every reinforced concrete solution a partially pre-stress solution. And some of those have 0% post-tensioning and some of them have 100%, although it's very rare we would see a design solution without any non-stress reinforcement. But um, if, if we consider that every reinforced concrete solution we offer as partially pre-stressed, then it takes a little bit of the mystery away from the design of the, the whole post-tensioning side of things. Um, because it does become a bit design intensive and designers tend to stay away from it at times. Um, just the arrow down. Ah. Thank you. So the other term, in terms of definition and what we use as a solution, is the bonded versus an unbonded system. So again, those of you that have not been exposed to a lot of post-tensioning or seen a lot of literature around post-tensioning but not been involved with it as a construction solution, may have seen a lot of literature from the US, which you predominantly is an unbonded um, solution or an unbonded system, which means that the cables are not permanently locked in their position. They are free to move. All the force is taken on the anchors, and there is a lot of negativities around that or, or problems associated with that in terms of demolition, durability, etc., etc. Most of the areas, and certainly in the Irish market, we, we use a bonded solution where the cable is fully grouted within a sheath. The cables, instead of being individual strands as they would be in an unbonded system and greased, the cables sit within a duct. And usually in slab systems there will be, as you can see in this point here, yeah, as you can see here, there'll be four or five strands within each duct. Um, and 
to bear in mind also that the, these strands then ultimately get locked in with an anchor at the edge of the slab and those anchors are designed for quite significant loads. Each cable is pulled. The normal cable size is a 12.7 millimeter or 12.9 millimeter diameter wire and it's seven wires wound around a central wire or six around a central wire. It's a seven wire system. Each cable will be pulled to a notional load of around 150 kilonewtons. So if you're talking a five strand system there's 75 tons on each anchor which when you start placing them at X amount of centers there's quite a lot of loading concentrated at that particular point so quality of concreting and placement and positioning and detailing of those anchors becomes very important but point of that slide was we deal with a bonded system here um, from a design perspective and some of these have, have sort of been mentioned from a, a, an engineer's advantage or a designer's advantage point but certainly the biggies will be deflection control um, and when we when we design with post tensioning we will um, prepare a set of preliminary designs and usually they're are done by hand and obviously we have a, quite a lot of software now available different different programs that do the, the final design that we would use to do our detailed design certainly for any given slab thickness um, we'll do um, achieve a significantly greater span using post tensioning because essentially we're balancing out the self weight of the concrete with the post tensioning force so if you can imagine the suspension bridge it's exactly that that principle where the cable within the slab depth acts like the cables on a suspension bridge holding the self weight of that element the difference being that we actually apply the force to the anchors and it's designed per meter or per every cable spacing to take that element of concrete self weight that means when we're designing we're generally designing with deflections that are imposed due to the imposed load or finishes or or whatever live load systems that are put there. Fergal's touched on the cost and time advantages and I think we'll talk a little bit more about cost. And applications um, internationally the, the system is used residential on a lot of residential projects um, I understand in the local market that that's not that common and that we you know the biggest application will be the commercial and retail and probably car park solutions but in residential what we're finding that um, as time goes forward uh, people are looking for bigger spans greater flexibility contractors are looking for cleaner solutions particularly in concrete buildings so that we're, we're generally dealing with spans of seven meters and above um, we're also dealing with multi-use solutions so quite often we in, in a residential project we're dealing with car parking solutions or commercial below the residential so very often we're, we're, we, whereby we might have a, a reinforced solution above then that transfer structure 99% of the time will be post tension to reduce the depth of because we're transferring a residential grid into a car park grid or a commercial grid um, that transfer structure will be post tension as commercial or car park levels below um, the choice of structural solution varies from varies from application to application as well so quite often we'll find that in a residential project for example it will be driven towards flat plate solutions and we will try and steer the architects to put their grids like that commercially however <clears throat> unless unless we're we're blessed and sometimes we are where we are where we're given a, a, a square grid and we are able to deliver flat plates um, very often we will go for one-way band solutions so the most common the most common building solutions we we get are either a flat plate or a one-way one-way slab and one-way band system both of those offer real 
quite simple formwork solutions. And any concrete building, its delivery time really is driven by the speed of the formwork. Whilst we can help as much as we can with installation of post tensioning and stripping, at the end of the day, the, the speed and delivery of the project is, delivered, is driven by the competency of the form worker. Um, we, we have done quite a lot of hospital projects um, and that's one that Fergal's delivered in Dublin at St James. A flat plate solution, um, we were able to offer I think 250 thick slabs on about a 9 metre type grid. Um, high level of deflection control. We had some very nasty cantilevers with some big loads on them. And of course we're dealing in a hospital in some very operation sensitive areas as well. So uh, such as x-ray rooms or corridors <coughs> where there is a lot of foot traffic with wards beside them. So these sorts of projects require another level of design input and into the vibration analysis, etc., etc. Bearing in mind that post tensioning is still a concrete solution so that we tend not to get into too many issues around vibration. It's when I talk a little bit f f further down about myths around post tensioning because you, you may have heard stories. Um, one of the concerns is always around vibration but generally we deal with multiple span situations and with a, feel, uh, with a structure that has a still a reasonable self mass as opposed to a steel structure with a lightweight concrete topping. And car parks it's, you know, it tends to be a great solution for car park structures. Um, they inevitably end up, in the UK the grid is 16 by 8, 8 or 16 by 7.8. We would often see, a, again, a banded solution on the big span with a beam one way and then a thin slab spanning in the other direction. <coughs> we have a number of, um, what we call them special applications which are not as common in but are still delivered by the building market as opposed to the infrastructure market um, where we get involved and in, I'll talk a little bit about some of the international projects that we've been involved with where we use post tension rafts, a great solution if the ground is marginal um, and a reinforced raft becomes too bulky or too difficult to deal with or we've got some local soft spots we basically turn the profile upside down, reverse, we have a low point under the column and we will design the, the raft to spread that load against the soil's bearing capacity. And generally that does require a little bit of, depending on the soil condition, particularly if it's a clay, the settlement analysis becomes quite complex. But rafts can be a great solution for the contractor because we eliminate piles and that's big time and dollars. Um, we do a lot of, in, in certain parts of the world, um, at the moment we're doing a lot of industrial pavements in New Zealand. Um, the, the, in Australia, the industrial pavement market is heavily weighted towards the fibre concrete people. In New Zealand they tend to go more for the post tensioning. But what it does allow is large joint free slabs. And for industrial solutions where you've got very high either storage loads, rack loads, um, forklifts or cranage, say in a wharf, uh, uh, container storage, particularly on marginal ground where you've got low CBR type soils, which tends to be a lot of industrial areas, um, we're able to, you know, produce industrial pavements of, you know, somewhere between 160 millimetres to up, up to 350 millimetres thick, depending on, um, depending on the loading conditions in the ground most importantly joints at 60 metres or more, 60 metres being the nominal but we've done them longer um, and in a lot of those facilities joint maintenance represents, if you've got a lot of high traffic, joint maintenance represents around about per annum 10% of the construction cost of the slab itself, particularly with forklifts bouncing over joints. We have actually done been involved with one large airport pavement in Malaysia where we did the, the slab was ultimately 240 metres by 140 metres without a joint. No restraint but it was a very large slab and designed for three 747s. So that was again a very unique solution on very poor ground. 
Um, we, we, we have used it in strengthening of buildings. Um, you may have seen the use of external post tensioning. Where, where I've been involved with it is, for example, we've had some retrofitting of buildings where they've taken the building taller. Um, there's an increased moment on the core. So for example, it was an ex-office building that's been renovated into apartments, designed for a higher live load, now a lighter live load, but the building's gone taller, can't deal with the overturning on the core, will vertically stress the core. So again, it's, it's, it's how you use those cables, or, and it can be done with rod, it doesn't have to be cable, but in this case we did use cable, which is the vertical post tensioning. And there's an example in in Ireland that Fergal's been involved with, with the raft slab on um, the Derry Gold container, digester tank. There it is there. Talk a little bit about detailing, um, because we, hand in hand with design comes detailing, and it's very important from a designer's perspective. Um, so in a market like Ireland, um, where design is not common, but, it, but post tensioning may be a solution. Um, it's very important for subcontractors such as ClearTech to have design support that can work with the engineers to, to work around um, certain issues with post tensioning that don't exist with day to day reinforced concrete. So obviously we have, we're putting large forces into the slab. We need to consider the anchorage of the tendons, we need to consider the detailing of those anchorages, bearing in mind that those anchorages are a temporary solution, so they are only there for the life of the stressing. Once they are grouted and stressed, that they do become redundant. Or stressed and grouted, they are redundant. But the issues of having blowouts or failures at, during the time of stressing, stressing are not good. Um, spacing and set out of tables is important in terms of time, um, installation, consideration of facade elements um, or of cast-ins, um, all of that will need to be coordinated with the anchorages that are cast into the edges of the slab. And just on anchorages, most cables, most pores tend to be in the vicinity of, you know, an ideal pore size of 30 by 30 or 35 by 35, where the cables will be pulled from a single live end at the edge of the slab and a dead end or a, a lost end which is just splayed cable cast into the slab. Sometimes if we go to bigger pores the cables will be pulled from uh, and we would do notionally up to 60 metres the cables will be pulled from two live ends. Um, restraint is probably the single biggest issue um, that we need to deal with from a detailing perspective. Because we're putting significant forces into the slabs, and again, as a rule of thumb, typically on a suspension slab, we'd be looking at um, pre-compression. We look as designers, we look at guidelines, um, not necessarily hard and fast um, design rules, but more guidelines. So typically, we'd have a, a pre-compression in the spanning direction of around anywhere between 1.2 to, to 2 for slabs. If you're pushing two and a half, you're on the upper limits of where you'd want to be. For beam sections, you may be up to three and a half, and sometimes in the odd case where you might have a transfer structure, you could push that beam to five or six as a level of pre-compression. And those numbers are very easy to work backwards because we've got a net force of around about all the losses about 110 kilonewtons in each cable um, and that will then work back. So remember we're stressing, we're, we're, we're applying a force of 150, the net for or the resultant force with time is notionally 110. So we as designers have to account with, and again I'm using rounded figures because we actually have to account for the losses within the system. So there's losses due to inefficiencies in the jack, there's losses due to drawing in the wedges that hold the cable, there's losses due to friction within the system, and there's losses due to longer term effects such as creep and shrinkage of the concrete. So all of this needs to be put into 
but because the co because the concrete does move, and um, we have buildings that have stiff elements, so on a raft slab like this, restraints. The only restraint we have is the slab, other than possibly an edge beam or a perimeter beam that should be designed to slip. You've got the friction of the slab on the ground, and you've got the restraint of the existing slab beside it. So those things need to be considered when detailing additional rebar or calculating the forces that you need to put in the tendons. When we talk buildings, we've got walls, we've got cores, we've got return corners, we've got uh, ramps, we've got differential stiffnesses. So we need to look at elements of that, or we've got existing pores that we might be pulling up against. So we have to be very careful that we don't um, have a situation where, for example, you've got a building that goes up with two lift cores and you're trying to pull those two cores towards each other because it's going to crack. And in a reinforced concrete building, we have the benefit of close space reinforcement. It cracks, you just don't see them generally. And you, if you went and counted all the micro cracks and added them all up and you had a, a nice big one mil crack in a post-tension slab, you still get the, t the same total amount of crack. It's just in post-tensioning, it'll tend to let go in one point, and that will be the point of least stiffness. So return corners, we have to be very careful with all those. So we do have, a, we do have certain details that we incorporate into the buildings for post-tensioning to deal with issues of restraint. Poor size I touched on. Um, ideal size, 35 by 35. But sometimes we, we work bigger pores subject to uh, the contractor's um, needs. And some, some contractors have no issues with formwork and laying out formwork, and they like to do big pores. So we sometimes end up with pores up to 60 metres in one direction. And generally, again, they, we have touched over those, those numbers, but generally 60 metres is, is where you will be for your movement joints and your control joints. Um, any longer than that does become difficult to to manage and we start getting into special specs on the concrete shrinkage etc etc and the concrete price starts going through the roof. This is the one I get from a lot of people um, in and around where, where there's been um, some understanding of post tensioning, there's been a little bit of use, their mates have used it, the, we've heard about it from over there. So. I'm, going to I'm just going to touch on these in and around grouted post-tensioning. So demolition is one. We, we have a grout, we, we deal with grouted systems. So the demolition, demolition of post-tension buildings that are grouted is a very different case than those are, that are unbonded. Because our cables aren't live anymore, They're, they are basically locked away. There's still certain processes that need to be followed in terms of confirming that the grout, how, you know, so there's some local due diligence to go on before going and ripping it apart. But generally, you can cut cable, you can um, cut sections of the slab, and it's not going to go twang um, within control. Which then leads into the, the issue around retrofitting and penetrations. So, we always get that question as PT designers that post-tension buildings are very inflexible in the future if we want to do future modifications. Um, we can't cut holes in them, we can't cut stair voids, we can't, we can't drill our pipes through. Um, all that's nonsense. A post-tension building needs to be dealt with the same as any other building. If you're going to cut holes in it, it needs to be looked at by the engineer. You don't just allow, and plumbers are the biggest culprits, so they'll go and cut holes wherever they want to. Um, so I, my starting point on that would be, we, we got involved with Heathrow Terminal 5, the studies, the early day studies of the solutions, the, the structural solutions for that building, for the superstructure. And we, on behalf of the contractors, looked at the post-tension options, the engineers, who were Mots and Arabs assessed the post tension, the precast, the steel, the conventional, and it was it was ultimately decided that post tensioning, because they wanted to retrofit the building every 15 years with the spec and reasonable levels of retrofitting, cutting staircases, escalators, blah blah blah, moving shops, it was still decided that post tensioning was the most flexible solution and, and used in in Terminal Five. So. Um,
what we do do is insist, particularly in commercial buildings, that the cables locations are marked on the suffetes. So the, they generally will run a flick line in the suffete, so you'll be able to see where the cable locations are um, in any direction. Cables will typically be at anywhere from 1.8 to 1 metre centres, so smaller penetrations are very easy to deal with. Um, some of the larger ones, you've still got the same issues you would have in a reinforced building. Um, and there's another slide a little later that shows some of that. Um, some of the long-term issues, again, sit around durability, and durability is an issue with unbonded. So you, again, you might have heard of building, post-tension buildings where the anchorage um, corrosion and the cables have let go. Again, that's not in a, not in a bonded system. Um, the anchors are redundant, and it does happen in, in unbonded systems. Vibration is one we get. Yes, we are reducing the weight of the structure, but generally we, we still have reasonably heavy structure and there are times that we need to do fairly, like in the hospitals or in a gymnasium that's beside a residential or something, or, or we might have a, a, a bus drop-off ramp near a hotel. There are times we need to do vibration studies. Um, but again, post-tension solutions, because they are continuous, tend to perform quite well. Uh, in vibration solutions. I put bottom reinforcement there and I know here we're all designing to the Euro code and the academics that put that component together of it waved their magic wands and said we have to have bottom reinforcement but I can assure you that in Australia we do not um, have mandatory bottom mats in post tension structures so um, it is it is something that's crept into the design of post-tensioning over the years. It never existed before in the BS and the ACI. There is no actual need for the bottom reinforcement. However, we, we bless to the, the gods that put those codes together and say, okay, it's needed. We still use it in, in its ultimate condition, but it does introduce some inefficiencies in, in the sense that if you're going to need a, if you, if you can get a post-tension solution that will use more cable, um, it may be more efficient from you, so it takes away some choices from you, but that's how it is. Guides for wise men, Bibles for fools, is my uh, theory on codes. Um, this is a very detailed slide, and it was put together by the, for the Concrete Institute in the UK, but just to give some guidelines in and around what may be suitable um, penetration sizes and the processes around each of them. So smaller penetrations generally fit um, smaller penetrations generally fit within, within the, between the cables. Larger ones we may be able to lose one or two cables and then really big ones we might need to do some special engineering to support the edges which I think and they've been listed out but again the purpose of this is to, is to really show, don't, don't be scared of penetrations, they're just something to be managed or retrofitting. Um, that clearly, you know, there's plenty of services in there, but what it does show is the cable markings underneath. So, you know, again, a well set up building will, and well spec building will have those cable locations clearly indicated. If there is a need for drilling, what, what we will ask is that guys use a masonry drill to do, to do a pilot hole first. The masonry drill, will, will, it won't cut the cable, You'll just, it just burrs against it, so, whereas a, a, a diamond saw will cut it. So at least a pilot hole in the location before they cut um, gives them some confidence that they can go through, go ahead and not cut through a cable which is not necessarily the end of the world anyway, but we don't like them doing that. I'll let Fergal, I'll stay up here with okay. a little bit of cost. I suppose this is one of the areas that uh, keeps coming up is to what is the cost comparison between RC and PT and where are the savings in here? Uh, what we find is that once, um, once the RC uh, gets to about six to six and a half meters, uh, PT starts to be competitive and we start to get money savings. 
the advantage basically is we show here you know you've got your your uh, your concrete and your 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 or your concrete and your steel right off over on the far side you can see that our concrete has been our steel has been reduced down by nearly 66 percent our concrete by 25 percent we include our pt and that's how we get our savings right there are different vari variables on it but what we're talking about is a 25 percent decrease in concrete thickness for your slabs right and a 66 percent decrease in the reinforcement and that's how you get get your savings inside here um, in terms of costs it depends on how you look at it uh, people say it's in around 10% uh, of, a, of a savings between RC and PT but it, it's all variable on the type of project um, where where it is uh, you know there's differences if you've got large transfers and things like that it changes then um, so you know you've got to be careful um, these are are what I call I suppose cooking recipes right and they should be used with caution um, you shouldn't just apply this willy-nilly you need to be careful when you're applying the likes of these uh, cooking recipes uh, but they're they are uh, I suppose a, a way of looking at the difference between PT and RC very quickly and assessing it and being able to turn around to, to a client and say look we think you can get savings here by doing it this way um, I'll hand back now to, to Tim again, and we can, uh, I suppose, it's too Yeah, we're just going to tag team a little bit here. Um, so this, I think this slide really illustrates um, the advantages you can get, not, not just in the um, savings in formwork horizontally, but what can be done with the flexibility on the vertical structures. So if we look at this grid, as a re this is typically reinforced with a 225 on a six metre grid, notional loading, as opposed to the, the, the same condition with a post-tension slab, we might be a little bit thicker, but the solution offers a lot less columns, a lot more flexibility, and when you put the two side by side, in Australia, I don't know what the exact construction cost here would be per column per floor, but we can notionally say $1,000 in Australia. So when you start pulling out a lot of columns for the contractors, um, you start the dollars start adding up quite fast so that yeah that illustrates it quite well I think I think it's a good example where you can see the savings that by re putting it into a post tension solution you're after getting you're after clearing out half the columns basically and that again comes back to you know the time savings uh, once your once your form contractor comes in and also bringing all of that back down to your foundations so there's savings everywhere to be had So, and, and I'm certainly not going to drag us into a long theoretical um, assessment, but um, there are, when, when we look at the preliminary layouts for post-tensioning, before we start going into our, our any detailed analysis on software, and you know, I do come from the days before of that, before that, um, where we do this manually, um, we start looking at span on depth ratios and again these are these are outlining codes and design guideline books so we know where we sit with those we look at levels of pre-compression whether it's in the spanning or the non-spanning direction in the case of a one-way slab because there are minimum levels of crack control and we we start with a load balance so in other words the load balance is the balancing of the component of self-weight and how much force we put in there in the parabolic because uh, I, I do a few lectures to, at, to the young guys at uni, I said, if you're ever going to go out, get a tattoo, get WL squared on eight on your chest backwards, so you see that every, every morning when you get up, because it is the one single formula if you're going to design anything in structures that can't, you, everything comes back to a simply supported structure. But we use the WL squared on eight in terms of the load balance is the uh, catenary of the cable balances out the W of the self-weight. Um, so if we took a quick example, one-way system. Yeah. I, I suppose what, we're, what we want to try and do here is just give you um, a kind of a quick example of 
uh, I suppose, a typical project, right? Um, a nine by 7.8 grid, right? And what we want to do is very quickly run through how we size up and how we come to the, the things that we, that we come to, the likes of the um, L over D, how we use those and how it can be quickly used uh, inside in, in, your, in your different days practice. Um, okay, so I suppose let's run through it very, very quickly. The L over D ratios, and I suppose this comes back to an important point. If you're going to do anything in post-tensioning, the first thing that you're going to need is TR43, right? That's your code. You need to use that. That's the most important document that you'll have. The L and D ratios that you see here for the loads of uh, 2.5 kPa, 5 kPa, and 10 kPa, um, all of that is inside there, right? Again, these are what, what I call the cooking recipes that you need to do to size and come to, uh, I suppose, a solution, right? The other few bits down at the very, very end there about the end bays, uh, when we look at end bays, we look at them slightly differently and we increase the L by 1.15, okay? So we give it a 15% kind of lift, okay? Um, because we're dealing with that end span, you'll be familiar with the bending moments on, on that, okay? Simply supported spans, uh, the L is multiplied by 1.35, okay? And we give the PNAs there, they're approximate. Again, what we're, what we're trying to get to here is that you have a feel for the, the type of figures that, are, that we're using and that you can go back and you can kind of use those figures to a certain extent. Yeah. It's important that those, those pre-compression levels don't get too high because you, you know, long-term creep and shrinkage is an issue. So once you start, and I think early days when post-tensioning was um, started to get from common in Australia in the 70s, it was great that the, the designers pulled the hell out of the buildings and they were, you know, they, but they found that they were overbalancing the weight of the structures so that whilst you could technically get a, a 170 or a 160 thick slab to span eight metres, 20 years later, people are sitting at their desk and the pens are rolling off because the slabs are hogging, you know. So, so, and and the building columns and you know, there's a number of columns we see the build the columns reeling in where pre-compression levels exceeded three and three and a half on the slabs, and the concrete concrete grades were a lot less. So we had very high levels of creep. Okay, so I suppose looking at the initial sizing, we've looked at the uh, internal spans. We've got a 7.8 meter span, right? Uh, we're dividing that by 45. If we were to go back slightly, you'll see that our span to depth ratio was, um, was 45 there for slabs, okay? And we're multiplying it by uh, 0 0.85. And that gives us a slab depth of 150 millimeters. So that's the slab that we're looking at here. So if we look at it inside here, uh, we're looking at a 150 slab for that, okay? Again, we look at the end bay, and what we're doing again is we're just basically sizing it up based on our, uh, our ratios, and we're getting a 170 slab. So if we go back again, what we're talking about is the end bay, which is inside here. So what we're going to have is a 170 slab here, a 150, a 150, and a 170, all right? So we're dealing with those end spans and the middle spans. Then we look at the bands, and again, what we're looking at is we're looking at a 9-meter span. We're dividing it by uh, 25, uh, which is from our... L and D ratios here, right? And, oops, sorry. Uh, and we're multiplying it by uh, the 15% because we've got an end, an end span there, all right? And we're getting uh, a 420 millimeter deep uh, beam. And generally with, um, with bands or, or beams inside there, we generally try and go for uh, either a 1.5 uh, at the top and a 1.2 at the bottom, which will give us maybe a 1.5. In this instance, we've got gone for a 1.8 band, all right? But we generally try and keep it at that because when we look at the PT, we find that we'll have a little bit more PT inside there and we've got to get our anchorages inside there. So 1.8 is, is roughly what, what works 
works best. Yeah, so when we talk one-way systems with post-tensioning, we have wide flat beams. That's and, and it does become a question is are they wide sections of slab or are they actually beams because the whole theory of beam confinement and beam shear starts getting a little bit hazy when there's such wide flat sections but it allows the efficiency of drape of the cables. So. Well, just a, you know, when, when we do that, that, and again bearing in mind that these are preliminary, this is our starting points for when we look at a concept to conceptualise the slabs, um, we'll look at the percentage of self weight to balance. So on, on the far right where it says load to balance, that is a component of the self weight. Um, and these, where we've got, typically where we end up with higher live loads, we'll start balancing more of the self weight to lift it up more. And that's around if, you know, the, the efficiency of use because we still have an ultimate condition to deal with. Generally, when we look at this and we've complied with our span on depths, our, um, our deflection conditions will be more than satisfied, but we still need to add, usually in the negative, we still need to add some non-tensioned reinforcement to comply with the ultimate um, strength criteria. Um, so, yeah, I suppose what we've done here is just given an example of the load balancing of the slabs um, and basically uh, if we just go back there I think we took a car park in this instance uh, we took 70 percent of the, the the self weight of the slab right and we applied that across it and we got roughly um, what sort of uh, load we were going to have on it okay we then applied that here um, and this is, I suppose, a part where, where we're looking at the drape of the cable, um, where it starts, where it's going to be at the middle, and how, how we're using that, um, and how we're getting the efficiencies out of that, that cable. Um, <clears throat> we then apply that to, the, to the, the moment where our moment W L squared over 8, which is tattooed on everybody's uh, front, um, and our P and H. Um, and we basically work out what our P is going to be for the width of slab, right? And we get that as, uh, in this instance, 2, 3, 4. So right? the P, P times H is the force times the eccentricity within the section. So it's the internal, that internal moment that's created by the force in the cable times the, the, exit, the, the position of the cable relative to the centroid um, that gives us the uplift. Yeah. Um, and I suppose we then know what, what that force is and we can apply the number of strands that we're going to have inside in the slab. So in this instance, we say that we have uh, 2.13 strands per width of, sl of slab. So when we go back and we look at that, we can say that we're going to have 4S13s at 1.8 millimeter spacing and therefore we have designed or we've done the preliminary design now for for our slab based on a net force of 110 sorry yes per strand yeah so that's the net force after all losses and i think uh tim touched on that earlier he talked about the the 15 ton that you you would normally have but then when you look at the losses uh due to creep shrinkage uh wobble and and friction and uh, um, loss as well, uh, wedge exactly. loss. So, you know, that's basically how we how we how we size these things. Again, similar. we do a similar exercise again with uh, the bands, and you can see down here we have three by five uh, s thirteens, and again, that's why we have a one point eight wide band inside there so that we can fit these three anchors and these are big anchors they're 5s 13s so we need area inside there to fit those and to take the the compressive force so again we're just looking at what the pna is and comparing that to what we what what our i suppose our gut feel is on on those and whether we're we're staying within the requirements of of uh, of the the pna and and finally, just to show you exactly, we, we've laid out there roughly, we've got uh, 
the uh, two times 3S 13s typically and then inside in the bands we've got three times uh, our 5S 13s. So that's basically the beam and the slab fully sized. Okay, sounds very easy to do it now. Uh, it takes a little bit more time and it takes a little bit more understanding. Um, what I would say is if anybody is interested in doing projects like this, you know, feel free to pick up the phone and ask us. You know, I mean, we'll give you our details afterwards. But I will add, if you can't do these numbers, you shouldn't have an engineering degree because this is basic statics. <laughs> um, uh, and I suppose the other the other thing as well um, is if if we if if you are doing this stuff, um, there are two two programs to to use. There's uh, there's wrapped. Uh, which is has been developed by Gil Brook, and Gil comes to Ireland every now and again, and he does a lecture every now and again, either I think in in Arabs and and a, a few of the other uh, uh, institutes around the place. Um, so, you know, that's one one uh, program that can be used. The other one is uh, RAM Concept, uh, and they're the ones to to work with when you're when you're doing post tensioning. Um, so very quickly, we'll just go through, I suppose, some of the projects that we've been doing. Uh, this is a digester tank down in uh, in Cork. It's actually the biggest digester tank in the world. Uh, it's uh, 78 uh, meter diameter and 10 meter high walls. Uh, the pores we did down there were uh, 2,500 um, square meters, um, and we had uh, the solution that we came up with was to reduce down the slab thickness. It originally it was a 500 deep slab. We brought it down to a 180 deep slab uh, and we reduced down the wall thicknesses as well. And we actually uh, put post tensioning into the walls and into the, into the slab. So what we were doing for the, for the contractor was just basically saving him money. Uh, he didn't end up having to put in these really, really thick bases uh, and you know, it, was a, it was a great solution for, for him. Um, the next one uh, is one that we did uh, here recently, uh, the Mercer's uh, Institute of Aging in St. James's, uh, which we finished fairly recently. Um, and again, uh, a post-tension solution which had pretty much everything in it. Uh, we had large spur beams, uh, we had you know, poor areas of over a thousand square meters, um, plus smaller pores. You know, and there was absolutely everything was thrown at us in in that particular uh, project. Um, Vibration again, control. Yeah. Um, again, it's a it's a hospital. We had to look at, at vibration. It was, I think, key for for Arabs uh, that you know we got that right from the very very start. And uh, you know, it's 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 an in, it was a, an interesting solution for 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 the contractor and. Uh, certainly went 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 well um, the other project that we did is the UCD science building uh, anybody who's been out there will know the the beautiful stairs that flies up uh, all that area there is uh, I suppose it's it's a hybrid of post tensioning and reinforcement and that's what we applied to this particular solution uh, I know Tim has talked about the idea of partial reinforced uh, post-tensioned solution and that's what we applied inside in the, the science building in this particular instance. So I suppose what we did there was we tried to, to be smart with what we could do, get the spans without pulling the, the, the cores towards each other and yet using post-tensioning to give savings back to, to the contractor. Um, the next one is uh, a warehouse down in Foynes uh, that we did this year. Uh, in Argosy, uh, it was again 5,000 square meters. Uh, we were asked over Christmas to look at this project. On the 5th of January, we signed the contract and we were finished the project by, uh, I think it was the, we got onto the site in March 16th and I think we were off the site by, uh, by April. So it was really, really quick. We got in, we got out. Uh, the job was done. Uh, again, it was a great solution. Um, 
using the 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 post tensioning we got great savings in reinforcement inside it and we also got a uh, a durable solution for for the client and for the um, uh, for the for the engineer um, the next one Canada house uh, many of you have seen it there in Stevens Green again a solution that uh, we did as a post tension solution um, doing this the the uh, the different bays in in post tensioning and again very quick construction we had it up uh, very um, and again, it was a good use of post-tensioning within the Irish market. I'm just going to flick through a few that I think that we're done then. Um, this, these are going to scroll through, so we'll have to just bear with me when we come back. That first one is a 40-storey high-rise. Um, not so much the high-rise itself is exciting, but the, the foundations for this building, that is a raft, post-tension raft, which you can see the, the big tables there, two metres thick. Um, on around about 600 kPa bearing of dense sand. Um, but by not piling a building like that, saves around about three to four months in the construction program. But a fairly design intensive solution, and you've got to be very careful with the multi strand anchors there. Um, this is Dubai Airport, which doesn't quite look like that anymore, but we, the, um, we got involved in the stressing of the concourse. Um, which in itself was just big beams and big slabs um, designed to take the 380s driving over the top. But interestingly above, about this job was the expansion joints are also stressed, partially stressed for, as an earthquake joint. And they used post tensioning cable because of the ductility created. They didn't pull it to its full capacity, to around about 30%, but the cable provided a very good connector after the event of an earthquake. Um, and that was just something a little bit unique. Seen that? Um, just, I threw that shot up there. That's a, that's a hotel in Siam Rip in Cambodia. Um, I just put it up there because we do get involved in some very weird and wonderful locations and people worry about the application of post tensioning in different markets. If anyone's you know, been to Siam Rip, it is fairly basic. So 20 was design, that has a transfer slab spanning 11 metres with four storeys on top, 450 deep. We've got post tensioning in there, the guys did it from Malaysia. Um, site mix concrete but controlled quite well, 28 MPA design strength. Something a little bit different but poured basically in the jungle. Um, we've got another different one like that up in a second. The other, the other slide when it comes up that I wanted to show is a house. It's probably the most complicated project I've ever been involved with, and it's in KL. It's Swatch for yeah. the richest man in Malaysia. Um, but what was unique about it was that the, the house is so complex, it only sits on three columns. The spans are about 18 metres across, but this is a, this is actually a 14 metre cantilever with a four metre back span. That looks a bit quick to see it, but with three levels on top. Stress it out across, but it has to be pulled down vertically to control, so it sits like a big stadium. Um, extremely complex, but what it shows is that we can apply the, the forces and the detailing of post tensioning in a very complex structure. Um, no, and just one more, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Well, this is just where I've been recently, which is more than interesting. This is in Kabul. Um, so we We've worked on projects in, in a lot of different locations. So currently we're doing the tallest, tallest building in Kabul, tallest building in Kathmandu, tallest building in Colombo. They're all post tension. They all work in terms of VE exercises and they all worked for the contractor and developer. But you can see with the right guidance, you know, even there in a market like where you've got very basic, and that guy is standing there with an AK 47, that they do, they are able to get quite decent form work, reasonable building solutions in, and if, if any of you have travelled abroad to some of the more basic locations, you'll generally see a mismatch between the concrete and if you've ever been on a building site. It allows very clean building sites. So, and then following in with the trades and the services, the quality of building for those locations improves significantly. So, yep, but I think if we've got any time, <laughs>
Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tim and Fergal. That was a very interesting lecture, and I think you had a lot of uh, practical applications there and useful tips. So, uh, just want to open it up to the floor if anyone has any questions, and uh, if you could just wait, I'll give you the mic. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might make a brief comment before ask the questions. Mm -hmm. I was around in Australia in the late 60s, early 70s, when the interest was really building up in uh, the uh, pre-stressing of uh, floors. Uh, my memory for names isn't great, but I think Brachi is one name that comes to mind in CSIRO. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at any rate, uh, the, the question that I, well, the, the comment first of all is that it seems to have taken quite a while for the technology to uh, move itself halfway around the world. And it's good to see that it's in full use here now. But um, during the, your, 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 your talk, uh, you barely mentioned shear at all. Um, now, I understand why. And of course, the load balancing reduces the shear problem. But um, presumably, one does make some shear checks on the slab. Yes. <laughs> If, if I can comment, obviously, when we talk flat slabs, um, and I'm, I'll focus on punching shear, which I think we're, we're really talking about, and I did touch on it with the band being or sort of where I was going as opposed, we tend, with post-tension solutions, we tend to be thinning the concrete down a lot, and quite often, you know, punching shear, punching shear is, a, is a governing component of what we need to check. Um, as part of the preliminary exercise, it would be part, it would be something we would look at. If we were doing a raft slab or a transfer slab, it would be the first thing we would look at because usually those are governed by punching shear. It's usual, certainly in, in a um, banded solution, we would rarely be governed by punching shear because we could accommodate the beam shear within the bands. In a flat slab, yes, it, it is something to consider, particularly on the edge columns and particularly when we have a lot of penetrations around columns, which architects and services engineers love to do. Um, so yes, punching shear is, a, is, a, is of prime consideration, but post-tensioning, despite some of the codes not quite helping us, but post-tensioning does assist in increasing punching shear capacity. Okay, is there anyone else got any more questions? Yep. Having studied with Guillon and, subs and later on uh, Fresine in France, um, it's a great tribute to the early work done by them and the advances that have been made. The one thing you haven't dealt with in sufficient detail really is the, the problems. And the greatest problem then, as is now, is the question of grouting. And I'd be interested to hear your some views on the grouting, both the, the practice of it and the method of it, and also the materials of it. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, grouting is from a, I suppose from the, the specialist contractor side, yes, grouting is a, is a very critical point. Uh, and I suppose for, for us in ClearTech, um, I suppose we have looked at, uh, I suppose, care certification and things like that. So, um, the, one of the, the areas that has caused a lot of problems, I think, and when you're talking about the, the problems with grouting that existed many moons ago, it related to how they were actually doing the grouting, that it was a mix of Portland cement and sand, right? It was very arbitrary. Uh, I remember the tests that were, were being done at the time uh, was that you basically stuck your hand inside in the grout and you lifted it up and if it dripped that was satisfactory right that has all changed now we have pre-bagged grout so it's a lot more scientific you don't get any variations now the grout is 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 has to be approved by cares and uh, there is there is no options basically on that so I think it has progressed significantly um, and I don't think, I think the, the problems that were there before that existed on the likes of the bridges that did collapse because of the salts and the, I suppose, the lack of grouting that had actually happened previously, um, that was old technology 
the technology has progressed. It has been, there has been a lot of innovation in terms of the machinery, uh, the pressures that are used. There's a lot more application um, involved now with doing grouting. So I think all those things have been addressed. Um, but I do understand, yes, there were problems and back a, a good number of years ago, but I think that has been addressed now. Yeah, it's a cementitious, but it's a pre-bag grout, so there's no, it's, it's specifically one bag goes into the mixer and you add, uh, I think it's 35 litres of water into it and there's nothing else added. So it's, it's, it's purely a specifically grout or bagged grout and it's, it's known as a duct grout. So you do, there's no variations and it literally is, you know, it's standardised now. And you can't vary. You can't vary from that. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. You have a loud voice. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's it's things like this that are going to to get designers to, I suppose, start using post tensioning. Uh, at the moment, it is very much a, a contractor-led solution at the moment because there's value to be got by using post tensioning. So the contractor is looking for, I suppose, a uh, an advantage when they go to tender and that's where we generally get involved but I think you know there are there are some some engineers now who are who are looking at this and who are I think I think there's a there's a bigger focus now coming onto it you know I think people are realizing that they can't just ignore the stuff you know it's it's becoming more um, you know a part of of what what happening in the industry. Um, certainly the developers now are looking at it as well and they're seeing, you know, a lot of developers have been over in the UK, they've come back and they've said, well, why aren't we post-tensioning over here? I also think from an engineering perspective, when you're doing those early day concepts, you would work through the feasibilities and, and sometimes you're, you are locked in with what the architect gives you. However, there are times when you've got to look at several options or you, you, know, you are sensible to look at whether it's even steel, precast, whatever. Um, for, for certain applications, certainly you would think when you're doing those concept type designs, post-tensioning would be one. And those sorts of preliminary exercises we were going through would be what we would anticipate the engineers would do. And then you obviously seek some advice, but then that allows the whether it's a contractor or a developer to get some prices and so. Anybody else? I just had one quick question. It was, uh, presumably a lot of times you'll get involved then, um, you'll be brought in by a contractor on a building that's already been designed by somebody else or another consultant. So you'll be coming in as a subby and is it difficult then to get the design changed at that point? And who signs off on the whole? You only sign off on part of it. And I suppose in conjunction with that then, I suppose your design is only as good as how it's built and how it's specced. So you'd mentioned TR43 before. Is, is, is there a fairly decent spec part to that um, that you would then put into the contract? Um, um, is there a decent spec part to that? I, I wouldn't say yeah. there is a decent spec part to it, but um, the, okay, it's it's in development then. Um, okay. And I think that relates back to your to your grouting question, uh, but. Um, I suppose, yes, we do get involved at the contractor stage. There have been a number of projects where we've been called in by the consultant, um, you know, which, which is a big, a big help, you know, that we've come in at the time when they were looking at different concepts and trying to come up with different solutions, and they asked us to, to look at the solution, and it turned out that that was the, the best option uh, for what they were looking for. So, yes... It has been up to now very much a contractor-led solution, but 
we are finding now that you know the engineers are are being I suppose pushed into producing you know different concepts different designs and I suppose in some of the cases the developers are actually looking at it as well and saying why aren't we doing this like we're doing it in London or you know the Middle East I mean that's that's pretty much where, where it's coming from Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just going to hand over to Eddie Phelan just to give the vote of thanks. Um, when I was asked to, to give a vote of thanks on this, the first thing you do is you do a little bit of research so you've got some interesting comments to make and unfortunately I think you've probably covered most of it between what the speakers have said here and the contrib contrib contributors from the, the floor. Um, I suppose the, the one comment I would make is that it's you're getting efficiency, and with efficiency you're reducing redundancy. Um, and that requires that the designer understands the design, undesi understands the loads, but also understands the construction process and the supervision of that. And certainly you mentioned that you worked in India. I've seen some projects out there and I would be scared of it's them. But, but um, it's not fun. But I think it's something that really we need to, um, to grasp and to look at um, designers getting more involved at the initial parts and not just leaving it to the contractors. If there's an um, efficiency and a cost reduction to be achieved, that should be achieved for our clients mm. rather than for the contractors. Um, and with that, I'll just ask people to uh, show their appreciation in the normal fashion. Okay.